right, everybody. Well, welcome to another episode of Red Grace Media. As always, my name is Emilio Ramos. It's good to be with you today on the program. We have a very special guest. Ray Comfort is joining us and very, very excited to talk to him. Uh, but as always, make sure and go to the channel and just in conjunction with today's episode, really encourage you to go to the playlist and find the new apologetics videos that I recently did covering all kinds of issues, including evangelism and apologetics. Make sure and go there and profit from those. But today on the show, uh, I got to tell you, I'm really excited because it's always a lot of fun to talk to Ray and find out what he's doing. Uh, but I, I'm really excited to talk to Ray today because we're going to be talking about a proper law and gospel distinction and a proper use of the law in apologetics and evangelism, which is so absolutely important for us. So um, without further uh, ado here, Ray, welcome to the show, brother. It's good to see you. Good to be with you again. Good to see you again, Melidia. Yeah. Hey, I was recently down at Living Waters. We did some episodes on transhumanism. How, 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 how did you enjoy that time? Those, those are some pretty radical subjects we talked about. You were down at Living Waters. You were up at Living Waters. Up at Look, Living Waters. Yeah, you don't go, it's like going down to Jerusalem, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed those programs. I've, I was very impressed with what you said, Emilio. It was wonderful. Yeah. And then recently after that, um, you got a you got Dr. Phil that reached out to you to do a show on kind of what we were talking about, which was implantable technology. Could you how much uh, could you share about that? How how did that all go down? Yeah, it was kind of strange. Um, firstly, they they contacted my secretary and. Uh, I said, yes, I'd go on, and then a producer called me, a second down producer, and we talked for about 20 minutes. She was very impressed. She said, this is great. Then another producer called me, and then after that, they called up and said, it's all off. We've changed the subject of the program, and I thought, oh, that's a nice way of saying we're still doing it, but you're not good enough. We don't want you on, so I said, oh, praise the Lord, whatever, and I just prayed about it. And next thing, they changed their minds, and they said, we want you in the studio. We don't want you as a guest, but we want you in the studio, and we want you to ask questions of Dr. Phil from the audience, which was kind of strange. I was like, I'm a heckler, all of a sudden. And so I went down there. It was, I uh, had to sign so many forms. It was ridiculous. I mean, years ago, you just walk in and say, yeah, but I had to sign my life away. And then it just started and they had these guests and I had to butt in and it took a lot of courage because I had to change the subject from what they were talking about to the things of God. So I spoke probably for 60 seconds. That's about it. And then it was all over and I came home and that was it. Oh, wow. Wow. So it wasn't but, an in-depth interview. I ended up yeah. praying with a producer. Um, the, the producer there, she's a Christian. She loves the Lord. And it was a great contact. And I gave her a book I've written called How to Be Free from the Fear of Death. And I said, I would love to talk on this subject because everybody's tormented by the fear of death and we've got an answer. And she totally agreed. So we prayed together. And so who knows what might come from that? Wow. Well, that's great. Uh, I suppose that uh, it's important to always see how God redeems every situation like that. But uh, that's, that's wonderful, Ray. Um, you have another announcement uh, that you're doing that I thought was just amazing. You sent me a video of, of what you're doing in London in, um, on May 6th for the coronation of, of King Charles. And real quick, before we get into that video, why don't I just play the promo and then you can talk about it That's here on really the other good side. Idea. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm going to do that here. Give me just one second. This is the British Royal Coat of Arms, and that crown on the lion's head is symbolic of the dominion of King Charles III, especially as defender of the faith. On May the 6th, he will publicly make an oath before God to defend the Church of England. That's what defender of the faith means. This will be done in England's most famous church, witnessed by hundreds of millions from around the world. In other words, the world is going to church, where they'll join in a service about Jesus, God, and the Bible. King Charles will lay his right hand on the Bible and swear before God to uphold the Scriptures. 
he'll hold the royal scepter as Solomon held the royal scepter. And when he's crowned, as was Solomon, all the people will cry, God save the king. And then he'll be anointed with oil symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And all this will be done in the name of Jesus. And the secular media will be forced to explain the symbolism. This is a massive and unprecedented opportunity to reach millions with the gospel. And the media is not going to ignore the service because they know of this world's insatiable appetite for anything royal. And this coronation is the crowning glory of them all. Those who come to London will see this gospel track as irresistible memorabilia. And because of the nature of the church service, it naturally flows into the gospel. It is with all this in mind that we're inviting Christians from around the world to go to London. If you're interested in attending this outreach, go to livingwaters.com forward slash London for more information. Again, the world is not only going to love these, they're going to treasure them. We have had over 3 million printed. All we need is thousands of laborers to come to London for a day. Will you come? If you can't, show this video at your church, take up a collection and sponsor a team. Don't let this pass you by. If you live down under, join the team that's coming from Australia. We're sending our television crew from California so you can be part of an Operation London television special. Teams from Living Waters Europe and Answers in Genesis will be there. Become a point person in your city. Share this vision with pastors and youth leaders. Then bring a busload to London. You've wanted to do something great for the kingdom of God, and this is your chance. This can be as big as we make it. If you know of good churches, evangelistic ministries, or key people in Europe who care about the lost, send them the link to this video. Just one text or email sent to the right person could change the eternal destiny of multitudes. And please pray for Operation London. For details of how you can be involved, go to livingwaters.com forward slash London. Now, Ray, tell us a little bit more about what led to this decision to do this in London. Why now? Well, um, about six weeks ago, I was sitting at my computer, my laptop, and suddenly an email came in, and I was just thinking about doing an outreach in London because I, I understand how big a coronation is. Most Americans don't, and I don't say this disparagingly, and most Christians haven't got a clue. They don't realize that the world is enamored with celebrity, but kings and queens, royalty, are celebrity on steroids. So the whole of America, the secular America, absolutely love the royalty. They can't get enough. When the queen died, they actually showed the whole funeral on television live in major networks, and they, they were forced to explain the symbolism. For instance, on her casket was an orb. It's about this big. And it's, some, and it's got a cross on the top, that's symbolic of the dominion of Jesus Christ over the whole world. That's what that orb is. There are two swords. One is a super sharp sword. Another is a blunt sword. The blunt short sword is symbolic of God's mercy. The sharp sword is symbolic of his wrath. Charles is going to be anointed with oil symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. He's going to lay his hand on the Bible and make an oath to God to guard the Church of England against the era of Catholicism. He's called Defender of the Faith. Now, here's a qualification. I don't think Charles is a Christian, and probably the whole ceremony is a form of godliness. However, godliness it is an incredible or springboard for us to proclaim the gospel. So I produced that tract bouncing off the coronation into the gospel, and people are going to take it because it looks like memorabilia. It's so well done. So we're getting three or four million printed. But let me tell you the exciting bit. I shouldn't really say it's the exciting bit, but it's very encouraging. I said I was sitting in front of my computer and just getting these thoughts together when I received an email. And a Christian brother said, I've just sold my business. What are you working on? I want to support you. So I told him, I said, I'd like to take advantage of this, go to London, give out tracks. He said, what will it cost? I said, I think I could do the whole thing for about $20,000. He wrote back and he says, I was thinking more of $100,000. I wrote back and says, I think I can do it for $100,000. So that's what he sent me, a check for a hundred grand. 
Well, mm. then is, you know, where God guides, he supplies or whatever the saying is. And so the whole thing's all paid for. I don't have to plead with anyone for money. We're just going to get three million tracks printed, ship them across to England. Got a church there that asked me to preach in London about a week before I got these thoughts. I wrote to them. I said, I can't come and preach in London, but will you host this? Will you take the tracks? Will you be a, a point to give them out? So uh, that's what's happening. Already 1,200 people have registered to go to London and give out gospel tracks. I'm hoping it'll get to 10,000 wow. or even more because we've got six months until it happens. This is only the first three days. 1,200 people have registered to go to London. So I'm super excited. Wow. That, that's incredible. And um, t give us some, get, like if someone's watching this, since you're not going to be there, uh, how would you advise them to, to springboard into the gospel? Using these gospel tracks, how would you springboard effectively into the gospel? Take this. Repent. Christ is coming. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know, we're, gonna, we're having a seminar for all those that are going to give out tracks. Oh. A night, the night before the coronation. We're going to start giving the tracks out three days before the coronation because it's going to be incredibly con congested. And let me just explain what I said before about most Christians don't really understand how big this is. And that's because we tend to say King Charles is an earthly king. He's godly. He's committed adultery. Uh, I worship Jesus. He's the king of kings. Yeah, so do I. But this is a wonderful opportunity to reach people that are going to hell. And we've been told to honor the king, honor all men. So if you say, look, I don't even think he's a king. I think he's the Antichrist. Well, honor all men, fear God, honor the king. And then it says, pray for all those in authority. Pray for kings. So we should be praying for Charles. We should be honoring him. And we should be springboarding off him as a king who's doing these wonderful things. When I say wonderful, these wonderful springboards for us to proclaim the gospel. So when I give out a gospel tract, if I was in London, I'd just say to someone, did you see the coronation? Uh, did you watch the service? Did you understand what he was saying when he laid his hand on the Bible? Have you read the Bible? Do you know the Old Testament, God promised to destroy death. New Testament tells us how he did it. You know, you think you're going to heaven when you die. These springboards are just so God-given, so mm -hmm. without precedent that the whole, yeah. the whole world is going to tune in. And Ken Ham, being Australian, knows how big this is because he's from the Commonwealth. I'm from the Commonwealth, New Zealand. This is what he said, and it's not even a joke. He said... Every network is going to take that service live, and if the president dies, they will not cut into that program. And it's so true. This is so big. The whole world is coming to church. The whole world. You know? It's like billions are going to watch this across the world. So uh, because it's, it's bigger than a presidential inauguration, it's bigger than the Oscars on steroids, because he's going to be in a gold coach. These swords, he's going to have a scepter as David have had, as, as Solomon had. Everyone's going to sing, uh, call out, God save the king. And they'll probably sing Handel's Messiah. You know, all those beautiful words. This is just such an opportunity. And we don't want to miss it because it's just a one-time opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Anytime um, the English do something formal like this, whether it was Queen Elizabeth's funeral or whether it's a wedding that they're having or something, it's usually very high Christology. It's very, very God-centered ceremonies that they engage in. But when you look at the policies and when you look at the politics and the culture of England, it's just utter hypocrisy. I mean, you could probably use that as as a springboard as well. You know, to, well, the they're not really they, they living it out. How much they need the gospel, how dark it is there. And yeah. and even with us, we are a nation in the US where we talk about God all the time, all our godless politicians with abortion actually quote scripture to justify the killing of babies in the womb. So we've got hypocrisy throughout the whole world, and we've got to remember there go I but for the grace of God, for such were some of you. When Charles is at a ceremony at the Commonwealth Games, where I think it was a big horrible looking idol they're all standing around we'd be caught up with the error at the ungodly we'd be deceived by sin but for the grace of god so we've got to remember that remember where we've come from so we've got compassion for the lost so instead of pointing a hole in our finger we should hold out a compassionate hand pull them from the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh so that's what i want to get into christians christians put aside the fact that you'll never worship 
Charles, you're not being asked to. Just realize this is an incredible opportunity. Even in America, we're going to make this tract available in the U.S. so that you can give them to your um, godless friends. And they'll be watching it on television. They'll take something, a memorabilia thing. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I, I've always thought about Living Waters as kind of like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. It's uh, something, <laughs> something, <laughs> something always really uh, just fun and uh, some some new invention that Ray Comfort's coming up with, uh, some some evangelical treat that you're coming up with every time. <laughs> but I think it's always great, and you're so good at at capitalizing on these moments and culture and stuff. It's it's fantastic. How do you? What's the thought process when you see something? How do you go through the? How do you go through the process of thinking? You know what? That I'm I can use that. You know, because things fade off the scene so fast. So it's like you got to move quick. Yeah, um, you got to realize that I, I've got no fear of failure. I'm, yeah. I fail all the time. You know, I, I am out of that boat with Peter running to Jesus on the water. If I sink, he's going to take me by the hand. And so I, I'm forever doing crazy things like this new little dog I've got, I'm trying sunglasses on him today. That's just crazy, <laughs> but it gets people's attention. Yeah. And uh, so I'm always thinking of crazy ideas, and uh, some of them work, you know, and uh, God uses foolish things to confound the wise, so here I am, Lord, send me. Uh, I want to be used. I want every minute of every day for me to be used to reach the lost and never lose focus, as the church had in the book of Acts. They didn't get caught up too sure. much in politics. <clears throat> they knew that the gospel is the answer <clears throat> to the political evils of their time, and we've forgotten that as a church. And we keep getting knocked back with the whole abortion issue, with the whole homosexual issue, every issue, pornography, everything. is just getting bigger and bigger because we don't see there's only one answer. You've got to change the heart of man. And that's where my heart is, mm. to reach people with the gospel and see them transform so they love babies in the womb and never would never harm a child. So they want to uphold one man and one woman when it comes to marriage because their heart's been changed through the power of the gospel. So... I'm just an ordinary guy with a, a crazy imagination. Let me tell you about my imagination for a minute. I was driving along the road a few years ago, and I was absolutely horrified because I saw a German shepherd that had obviously been hit by a car, and it was just lying there absolutely mangled, and I could see its head shape, and I could, I could almost smell the blood. It was so horrific, and all these thoughts came up in my mind as I passed it. It was a sack that had fallen off someone's bike and that was just sitting on the road but i saw it as a german shepherd that had been hit by a car car such is my imagination it really is crazy but it can be used for the kingdom of god to have an imagery say lord how can i be used to reach the lost use my imagination use my creativity ingenuity insight discretion give me those gifts because i want to be used of you while there's still time oh absolutely no i think that's great and let me just say this ray because um all the years I've known you in all the years that I did open air preaching with you out at Santa Monica, for example. People don't, what people may not understand is that while Ray Comfort uses a lot of humor and a lot of contemporary examples and springboards and things like that, I tell you what, the thing that has always kept me coming back to Living Waters and coming back to your ministry is that you do not compromise the message. And I remember early on coming out of a certain <laughs> evangelical background where I was surrounded by easy believism and praying the sinner's prayer and this kind of thing. I just remember your ministry being such a breath of fresh air to say, you don't need to force someone into the sinner's prayer to, to, to kind of produce some kind of conversion, right? <laughs> or try to manipulate their will or something like that. Um, I think over the years, you've demonstrated that you have to preach repentance, and you cannot simply preach decisionism. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because decisionism is not going away. Yeah, Spurgeon says, if you leave out the law, you're going to fill the church with false converts. He said, this is a very serious loss to the sinner rather than a gain, because it lessens the likelihood of his conviction and conversion. And you get these preachers that don't preach repentance, and there's a reason they don't. It's because they haven't seen sin as being worthy of repentance, because the law hasn't been used to bring the knowledge of sin and show sin to be exceedingly sinful. So when we back up and say, what did Jesus do? What did Paul do in Romans chapter 2? 
We see Jesus expounding the law and making it honorable, as it says in Isaiah, that the Messiah would do. Jesus expounded the law. Lust is adultery. Anger without cause. You're in danger of judgment. He just merely opened up the law. When you understand that, that lust is burning in your heart, your eyes are full of adultery, then repentance becomes necessary. It's not a matter of just believing. Repentance becomes necessary because God is holy, we're sinners, God can't have fellowship with sinners, we, re we turn and we turn in repentance to Jesus and have our sins washed away. And I, I'm not saying repentance is a work, we've got, much, we've got as much to do with our salvation as Lazarus had to do with his raising from the dead. He was dead, Jesus called him out of death and he responded once he was made alive. So God grants repentance, the acknowledging the truth. I'm not saying we, we're able, we're capable. I have sure. no problem with the sovereignty of God. I'm breathing because God's allowing me to breathe. I'm blinking and seeing and thinking, all because God's allowing me to. And my free will is a gift from God. So it isn't even owned by me. My free will belongs to God. So I don't see myself as being a totally free agent, and I'm really, really happy with the fact that God's in control of my life and that he's utterly sovereign, and if he just covers my nostrils, I'm out of here. So he's in charge, and it gives me great joy to know that. Well, I'll say this about repentance, is that if you look at it, right, in Scripture, it's a command. It's not... Um, it's part of the gospel. It's We have to command the sinner to repent. We're not... When we are using the, the phrase, repent and believe, we are not telling sinners to engage in good works so that you can be saved, right? We know that this is, in, in a sense, we're telling them this is the means that God uses to save and to convert a soul is, is by preaching the, the message of repentance and faith. It's not a message of do good works and then you will earn your salvation. Absolutely not. So I, I think we need to preach repentance without any fear of that whatsoever right. because the, Jesus did it, the apostles did it, and we should do it. Amen. Yeah, yeah, amen. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit, uh, Ray, just about a zeal uh, for evangelism. Uh, I want to approach this from the perspective of cultural uh, and even church culture, because I think maybe you, maybe you see this or maybe you don't, but I think that as Christians, we can go through seasons where we get sort of exasperated with everything going on in the church, everything going on in the culture. We could really let the vision for evangelism kind of fade away. And over time, I know that you have seen this. Ray, I know that you've seen this with really close friends of yours and many people you've worked with over the years in ministry that they start out good, they, they come, maybe they want to partner with you on some things, and they, they showed remarkable zeal and passion for evangelism, and then it, it just kind of wanes off over the years, and, and hey, listen, I would say we're all susceptible to that, but talk a little bit about that, Ray, just kind of sustaining your zeal for evangelism and preaching the gospel to the lost. I think the world, the words uh, or word worldview has been kind of overdone, but your worldview will determine your zeal for God. And by that I mean I've got a worldview of the church being in the lifeboat of the Titanic, a great big lifeboat. All around us, people are drowning. And so I'm doing everything I can to reach out and pull people in. If I can see an oar sitting there with which I can grab three people and let them get a hold, if I see a rope, I can grab ten people, I'll grab that rope. And so anyone who loses focus and begins polishing brass on the lifeboat, I feel like give them a good slap on the face. We're not here to polish brass on the lifeboat. We're not here to have cups of coffee and have fellowship. We are here to reach out to the unsaved and pull them. The Bible uses not water but fire. Pull them from the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. You see, this is the focus of the church in the book of Acts, and it should be the focus of the church in our century, but it's not. We've lost focus. And the thing that keeps my zeal going, and it's a fire that won't go away, it's getting worse, it's the fuel of gratitude. Gratitude burns in my bosom. It explodes. It's the high-octane fuel that drives this vehicle. And gratitude is there for two reasons. I've seen my sin, 
And he that's forgiven much, the same loves much. I love God with all my heart, and I love sinners with all my heart, so I'm not going to let them die. With every ounce of zeal I've got, I'm going to plead with them to come to Christ. And I want to show God that I love him. I love what he did on the cross for us, so how could I not obey him? And so we should have a zeal for God, and there was another reason I've got a zeal for God, and that is that he saved me from the power of death. Now, I can't explain to you how lost I was before I was found. But I know that I was Solomon. Solomon, vanity, vanity, he says, all is chasing the wind. And he had the wives, he had the women, he had the gold. Everything, he says, is just a waste of time. It's futility. I had that experience about a year before I got saved. Utter devastation at the futility of life. As a 21-year-old man, I had my own business, my own home, lovely wife, one kid, all the material wealth I could ever want, and total freedom to do what I wanted when I wanted. I could go surfing, slap a note on my surf shop, on my leather gear do um, store, that I, it was a leather gear store and a surf shop. I could just slam a note, gone surfing. Total freedom, and I thought, this is an absolute waste of time. I've achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve, and I'm 21, where do I go from here? And it was just, oh, and I, I just wept because of the fear of death and the futility of life, because that's what made life futile for Solomon. It was that death was coming. One comes to all, whether they're wise, unwise, rich or poor. And I could see that. So when I was saved from the power of the grave, oh, I can't tell you that. I couldn't explain to God or give words to him of gratitude. So what I can't put into words, I put into works. So I've had a zeal for God that's exploded for the last 50 years, and it's still there. When I get tired, I'm coming up to 73. If I get tired, I take no notice of it. I'm not going to have a snooze. I'm going to have to reach the lost. Get on my electric bike, take my dog, the new one's learning, and, uh, and go and find people and share the gospel and put it on YouTube and see hundreds of thousands, even millions of views. So I'm so encouraged that God's condescended to use this little nobody from nowhere for the furtherance of his kingdom. Uh, amen. No, that's great. I think gratitude is the solution for many things in the Christian walk. If we're grateful, uh, our worship will go up. If we're grateful, our piety will go up. If we're grateful, our prayer will go up. Our Bible study will go up. It, it, gratitude is a major incentive and a, and a beautiful Christian virtue. Um, let's talk a little bit more on the theological end of things, Ray. One of the things that I've appreciated about your theology over the years is what I believe to be a proper law and gospel distinction. And, uh, you know, depending on what circles you're kind of flowing in in, in, in the evangelical uh, and Reformed world, especially for me, I consume a lot of Reformed theology, and at different levels, Reformed, not Reformed, Evangelical, not even whatever, um, there seems to be a remarkable, consistent confusion on the, the relationship of the law and the gospel, and why, on the one hand, we have to keep those things distinct, but we have to use those things properly and rightly, and that is brought out maybe most of all in evangelism. And so just talk about the wisdom and the potency or the effectiveness of using the law and how and and, and, and how properly therefore to complement the law with the gospel. Well, the analogy I use, and I use it with sinners, and I think it's great to sometimes share an analogy with sinners. I'd say to them, let's imagine there's a doctor and he's got a patient in front of him who thinks he's incredibly well, he's fit, he's healthy. But the doctor has seen x-rays and knows this guy is going to be dead in two weeks. He's seen the x-rays. He has a cure to give to the patient. Should he just give the cure to the patient now or should he show him the x-rays? And the person I'm asking this question, they, they go thoughtful. Some people say, I'll just give him the cure. I say, it's not going to work because he thinks he's well. He's going to say, I don't want a cure. I'm well. I'm fit. Look at me. You know, I've got muscle. I'm healthy. Now, if the doctor's a good doctor and knows what he's doing, he's going to show him the x-rays, and he's going to show him the x-rays in great detail. He's going to make his patient sweat and say, look at this poison seeping through your body. You're going to be dead in two weeks. And when he's sweating, when he got to a point where the patient says, doctor, what, am, what should I do? That's when the cure comes out. He says, here's a cure. And I know you're going to take it, you're going to appreciate it and appropriate it because you've seen the disease on the x-rays. So then I say to the person, do you think you're a good person? He says, oh, yeah. So you're morally well. He says, oh, I'm very well. 
I'm a good person. So, okay, I'm going to show you the x-rays. These are the Ten Commandments. How many lies you told? Ever stolen something? Ever used God's name in vain? How could you use God's name in vain? That's so evil. You wouldn't use your mother's name as a cast word. God gave you life and you've equated God's name with human excrement. You've used it as a cuss word. And if you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery, you're looking at pornography, and I show them the x-rays and say, you're heading for hell. You, you're diseased. You're diseased morally, and God's wrath is going to come on, on Judgment Day. And Emilio, the most effective time in evangelism I've found is when I explain Romans 6.23 to the lost. I say this, do you know what death is? And they say, oh, it's just part of life. It's natural. I say, no, it's not. It's wages. The wages of sin is death. God is paying you in death for your sins. It's like a judge sees a heinous criminal who thinks lightly of the fact he's killed three women. He says they were prostitutes. No big deal. Judge says, I'm going to show you how serious this is. I'm paying you in the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is what you've earned. And I look the sinner in the eye and say, sin is so serious to a holy God, he's given you the death sentence. Capital punishment. Your death will be evidence to you that God is deadly serious about sin. Emilio, that little analogy, that expounding of Scripture, widens the eyes of the lost. So when I bring the gospel and they've seen the x-rays, they say, give me the cure. Give me what God has done. I want to be forgiven. I want to be washed. And yet five minutes earlier, ago, the, uh, earlier they were flippant about their salvation. And everything changes because the law brings the knowledge of sin. Paul says, by the law, uh, sin became exceedingly sinful. Law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's what Nathaniel used on David. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? That's when David cried, I've sinned. I've sinned against God. And that's why we see that penitent prayer of David in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Sin is called evil once the law brings light to what sin actually is. And under the sound of the modern gospel, David would not have cried out in such a penitent fashion. But he did because the wrath of the law came upon him. His conscience came alive like Lazarus from the dead. It was once stinking, but now it came alive and it began to speak to him and brought him to the foot of the cross, so to speak. Mm. Mm. No, that's that's so good. That's that's exactly right. And I think you, you raised something that is so important that when you don't use the law of God in this way, I think a couple of things happen. Number one, you really diminish what sin is. And you you, you really, what ends up happening is that, that then people start kind of creating their own dilemma, that their dilemma is not, let's say, forensic or legal, they've broken the divine moral law of God, but their dilemma is circumstantial or their dilemma is psychological or emotional, if they can just kind of come into a healthier state of mind. I mean, in our culture right now, Ray, I'm sure you've seen this, everything is about mental wellness, and there's apps everywhere now about how to calm you down and do breathing exercises and get in touch with yourself. But if we don't ground everything that's wrong with us as as fallen humans, if we don't situate that around the law of God, we'll ground it in something else like psychology or emotions or experience or circumstances. And 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 remarkably, I know you know this, a lot of churches actually feed into that narrative that it's felt needs that need to be corrected. It's God is here to give you a better marriage, better finances, better health. And if you remedy your circumstances, then you'll be flourishing as a human being. Speak to that a little bit, maybe the modern church and its, it's some, some of the areas in which it falters when it deviates from the law of God. Well, when you understand what the, the world's philosophy is, you just realize it's poison. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. God says, I will bless you if you deliberately turn a deaf ear to the way the world thinks. You know, psychology hasn't got a, a definition for sanity. You ask any psychologist, what's the definition for sanity? They haven't got a clue. <laughs> that means a psychologist subjectively can say, you're insane, you go into the mental home because I think you're insane. He could be insane. And I don't believe any human being is sane until they come to Christ. The Bible says 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. It's only when we come to Christ that we receive a sound mind. See, the demoniac legion uh, was sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. And until that, we're insane. And evidence the world is insane is that God is offering everlasting life as a free gift, and the world has every excuse in the book, wants to serve sin. End up in hell, mm. makes jokes about hell, cusses about hell, blasphemes the name of the God that gave them life. We live in an insane, in an insane world. Just watch the news tonight to see how crazy the world is. You know, one thing that uh, I've found also very profitable in speaking to the ungodly is to say, do you find life as a mystery? And they'll say, yeah. Do you find death a mystery? Yeah. Why were you born? What's your purpose in existence? What's going to happen to you after you die? I say, I don't know. I say, you know why you don't know? Because you've never opened the instruction book for humanity. Mm. So have you ever bought an, instru- uh, an appliance and you've thrown away the instruction book, just tossed it over there, try to put it together yourself because you know better. Yeah. And then you end up going to the instruction book to see what you did wrong. That's the way humanity has worked with God. We've turned our back on the scriptures and said we can do it our own way. And the fruit of the insanity of doing that is what we'll see on the news tonight. Every area, it's polluted by sin. It's destroyed by sin. Marriage, every philosophy, all the moral standards are just crazy. Nothing makes sense until you come to Christ. And he opens Mm. the eyes of your understanding and you can see all things clearly. Mm. Yeah, I I mentioned that there are a couple things that are wrong with an approach when we diminish or we set aside the law of God. I would say the other one, Ray, is that it's a direct reflection on the character of God. And so when we don't utilize the law of God properly, then we're not, we call it the eternal moral law of God for a reason, right? Because it comes directly from the very being of God. And so when we're not lifting up the law of God and using it like we should, like Timothy tells us to use it lawfully, right? To bring a sinner to repentance, right? If we're not using it in that way, we're really reflecting something about the character of God that's not true. And then people have this sort of this sort of fantasy in their mind of who God really is, that he's not the holy God of Israel, that he is not the holy God that is filled with righteousness and indignation. And then that vision of God also uh, ends up, you know, ends up uh, sort of vanishing away. And and people replace that with a God that's more like them. And so maybe speak to that of the effects that not using God's law uh, has on your doctrine of God, who he is. If you, if you read Psalm 50, um, God spoke to David and said, you thought that I was altogether like one unto yourself. And it uses the law just before that verse comes up. And if you look at the sin of Israel in the Old Testament again and again, they forsook God's law, turned to idols, and then created their own moral standard because an idol does not dictate your moral standard. That's why idolatry is so attractive to sinful men. If you can get rid of the God who gave his law on Mount Sinai and replace it with an idol, then that gives you freedom to do anything you want. And so that's all that's happened in modern America. You look at our recent history. We've forsaken God's law. Get rid of the Ten Commandments. So now we have a God that's more like the God on the pink nighty who's reaching out his finger to touch Adam's finger in that painting. Mm. Michelangelo, I think. God is nothing like we imagine him to be. And it's a great idea to explain to sinners how intimately God knows them. For instance, I like to say to someone, your eye is made up of 137 million light-sensitive cells. Each light-sensitive cell is made up of atoms. God knows the atom that's right in the middle of each light-sensitive cell. He sees it from the inside to the outside because he made it. He's that intimately familiar with you as a person. Knows you by name, the thoughts and of, of your mind. That's done once done in darkness is seen as pure light. Knows how many hairs are on your head. I like to say, does that make you feel good or uncomfortable? And most people say, it makes me feel good to know that God's there looking after me. I say, you think God's your friend? He says, oh yes, he's my friend. Talk to him all the time. So you know what the Bible says? God's your enemy. You're an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works. They say, really? Yeah, let me show you how you know God's your enemy. Do you use his holy name as a cuss word? They say, yeah. And the Bible says your enemies 
take your name in vain. And so what we've got to do is what Gideon did, he smashed his father's idols at night. If you can't do it during the day, do it at night. Smash your father's idols. Our forefathers have handed on to this generation an image of God that's erroneous, nothing but an idol, a big ooze of love and mercy with no sense of justice and truth. And the way to smash that idol is to use the moral law. Hmm. That law, when presented correctly, gives thunderings and lightnings and puts the fear of God in the hearers, as it did when God came with a smile on his face to give his law to Israel. They were so terrified, they said, don't let us speak, lest we die. Moses said, I was exceedingly fearful and began to shake. This is when God came with a smile. And so what we've got to do is make sinners tremble. Be Nathans with David. You're the man. Don't be embarrassed to say, you know, where are you going when you die? Well, the Bible says all liars are their part in the lake of fire. You know, when I say things like that, I'd like to say other things, but I dare not because in the sight of God speak we in Christ. I fear the Lord. I'm not going to compromise this word. My, my allegiance to, is to him and not to my hearers. And that should be the case of every Christian. We should be saying with Paul, wherefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And if we don't persuade men, it's probably because we don't know the terror of the Lord. Mm. Mm, no, that's good. And I can, I can honestly testify over the years of just, you know, for the time that I have been uh, with you in evangelism and seen your open air preaching and read your books and things like that, that the, just the power, uh, somewhere Spurgeon, I think it was, who said that the law are like 10 cannons, right, that are being pointed at the center. And, and, there, there's just nothing. We can get creative. We can get cultural. <laughs> you know, we can use all kinds of little therapeutic tidbits and things like that. But at the end of the day, there's nothing as potent as showing a sinner the weight of the law that hangs over them. And I guess for for people listening right now or watching this, Ray, what would you say to somebody that says, well, I go to a church but they don't really preach like that. They they try to be more relatable or they try to be more kind. You know, there's scriptures, right? Like Romans chapter two, where the apostle Paul says, you know, do you not know that it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance? And that, in my opinion, that passage has been twisted and abused to mean something like, if you just emphasize love and kindness, God will work more through that message than the message of the law and condemnation and hell and wrath. What what would you say to somebody like that, Ray? Because I think a lot of folks are are in that place today. Yeah, that verse in Romans 2 is sandwiched in wrath. Some of the most wrathful words ever spoken in Scripture are wrapped around that the goodness of God leads to repentance. For God, God will bring wrath and indignation upon every soul that works evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But, you know, if your pastor isn't preaching the law and he's just every day saying, every Sunday saying, give your heart to Jesus, raise your hand, he'll fill the God-shaped vacuum, don't get upset, don't get angry at him, pray for him and realize <clears throat> that we shouldn't get upset with the goings-on in the goldfish bowl when there's a whole world to fish in. Your local church is a goldfish bowl. And it's not working. They've got the goldfish going around and around. No one's catching a thing. But there's a whole ocean of this world to fish in. Look at what your pastor's doing wrong and don't walk in his footsteps in that respect. Look at what Scripture says. Look at what Jesus did. Look what Paul said. You who say you shall not steal, do you steal? You say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Learn to do that with a loving tone with sinners. You know, Amelia, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but tone is everything. Years ago, I used to have a drug prevention center in a building called the Regent Theater Building. <clears throat> and one day I received a phone call at 6.30 in the morning, and it was a friend of mine, and he said, the Regent Theater Building's on fire. And I didn't say, you're kidding me. I knew he was genuine because of his tone. His tone of voice convinced me. I immediately slammed the phone down and drove into the where, I, where my building was and saw it was on fire. And... And, and it showed me that if you've got the right tone, people will listen. A loving concern. Don't be afraid to tell people you love them when you say, look, I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. That breaks my heart. And they say, how can you love me? Don't even know me. Look, if you saw a family getting into a car that was sloped downhill to a thousand foot cliff and you knew those brakes were going to fail, you would go up and warn them. 
and your motivation would be love, even though they're strangers. And I'm here to warn you, because I know that if you die in your sins, you're going to face God's justice. He's seen everything you've ever done, and I don't want you to go to hell. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, Ray, I think also when it comes to tone, um, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why you've used, over the years, you've, you've used the good person test. Right, because it's one thing for you to sit there and can, and tell a person you've done this and you've done that, and you've. Whereas when you when you get the person to talk out loud, so to speak, and get and tease out the questions from them and get them to readily admit that they have lied and stolen and lusted and all of those things, it it, it really does kind of switch the conversation from you're condemning me to you're exposing me, and 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 although people are still not comfortable with that. They can't really they can't really attack you for being you know mean or mean spirited or condemn condemning or something like that. So um, so yeah, I, I think that's an effective uh, approach, and I think you're right. Tone is everything. I mean, if you think about Jesus with the woman at the well, he had some really hard statements. He had he had some really hard things to tell her and confronted her about her sin, I mean, and put her to shame. But the way he did it, right, the conversation he had with her, not compromising, but at the same time, his tone was obvious that he didn't drive her away. Yeah, you know, I, I just the other day I saw a gentleman that I've often stopped and talked to, and I'd never shared the gospel with him because he told me as a Christian. <clears throat> and he's had a stroke and he just crawls along the road. Sorry, the sidewalk, not the road. And yeah. my heart's always gone out to him, but I felt angry at him when I asked him, is he reading his Bible? He says, no. And I thought, is he really a Christian? And so I, I was driving past him the other day, and I thought, oh, I should talk to him, I should share the gospel with him. And I actually drove half a mile past him, or a quarter of a mile past him, and I turned my car around, went back, and I stopped. I said, hey, Terry, <clears throat> where are you going when you die? And he says, I'm going to heaven. I said, why? He says, I'm a good person. And so I took him through the commandments, and Amelia, you could have knocked me over with a feather because I came to the seventh commandment to lust after woman. So I said, Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, men of old, of them of old, you shall not commit adultery. Have you ever committed adultery? I just casually said to Terry, he says, yeah, a few, t a few times. A few times. I mean, I'm shocked that anyone would commit adultery. And so I tell you, you've sinned against God. You've lusted after woman. You committed adultery. And I've noticed at Cerritos College, I'm talking to these young girls, pretty young girls. They're like 17, 18, 19. And I've been saying, ever committed adultery? And they've been saying, yes. Mm. This world has absolutely lost the fear of God because everybody knows adultery is wrong. It's morally wrong. It's a sin against God. The conscience accuses it. The commandments accuse it. And yet there's so many of these young people have never really heard of the Ten Commandments. And I have to say, well, look, they're written on your conscience. Let's go through them and see if you agree with them. And as we go through, I'm finding more and more are thinking closely about the things of God. A lady came in the ministry yesterday, and she just about ate me up. I was overwhelmed. And it turns out she was a Catholic who read the Bible in 2019 at the beginning of COVID. Because of COVID, she says, I read the Bible. She says, I was so committed as a Catholic. And the Bible told me it was wrong. And she says, I never understood the gospel, never even knew about it. And she purchased, look, a pile of tracks. And she said, she said, I just discovered your ministry two months ago, and it set me on fire. And that's what we need. We need to encourage Catholics to read the Scripture because they will see in the Scriptures the genuine biblical gospel, which is the power of God to salvation. And so um, I was greatly encouraged to hear that because we've got a video coming out uh, for Catholicism, and it's got Catholic after Catholic coming to a point of repentance and me praying with them because mm. of the principles we've talked about today. Mm. And I've deliberately said to them, as we're going through, it's about 10 or 11 of these people that are Catholics, do you know the gospel? And they don't know it. I say, do you know why Jesus died on the cross? This sounds weird. Do you know why Jesus died on the cross? And each one of them says, I don't know. I don't know. And they've sat in front of a crucifix week after week in church, not knowing why, because the law doesn't necessitate it. The law hasn't been used to necessitate a sacrifice. There's no point 
and Jesus paying the fine if we haven't broken the law. So that law is such a poor. Spurgeon calls it our, called it our most able auxiliary. Mm. That is our most powerful weapon. Mm. And so Amen. we've got to bring it back. We've got to bring it back. We've got to bring those 10 cannons back yeah. and let sinners look down the barrels of those cannons. We light the fuse and say, if you don't get it on the road, these, these, these cannons are firing at you on judgment day. You've got to get out of the way. And the only way out of the way is to come to the, the foot of the cross. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you, Ray. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, because there's a lot of theological schools out there that that tend to lead you in the direction of whether it's just you know uh, a kind of overblown dispensationalism w- w- that tries to say well we're not in the dispensation of Moses anymore or law we're now in the dispensation of grace and so we don't really need the law anymore I know you've heard that I have you know there's also more uh, reform theology like new covenant theology that kind of makes the same error for a different reason. Uh, and, and again, sort of instead of going back to the law in evangelism, they would tell you, for example, um, just look at the moral example of Jesus and that that's all you need to do is just point people to the moral excellence of Jesus. But none of those things get to the root of the dilemma of man, which is that they are guilty before a holy God. And uh, as one of my favorite theologians, uh, Cornelius Van Til, would say, man is all wrong with God because he has broken God's law. And when you do all of that, Ray, I know that you have emphasized this just as much as emphasizing the law, that once you do all of that and once you show people the, the true misery that they're in, that the gospel comes in and the remedy of the gospel is so instantaneous, it's so logical that in a sense, you know, you don't need to work up the gospel. Once people see the dire dilemma that they're in, then Christ crucified as the remedy is 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 really truly good news. And so maybe as we come close to ending here, Ray, maybe speak about that. Speak about how kind of hand in glove, how the gospel then complements the law and completes the evangelistic process. Yeah, the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, what the law does is it sucks, sucks the oxygen all out of the room. There's no oxygen in the room left for the sinner. And as he gasps for breath, you open the door and let in the refreshment of the, of the gospel. It lets him breathe again. And so when I'm taking someone through the law, I'm dying. Inside, I'm dying. I'm dying with them. I'm, I'm thinking, I can't wait to get to the good news of the gospel. I can't wait to get out of the wrath of God into the, into the smile of God. I can't wait to have this person hear how the court case has been dismissed. But I don't let myself run ahead because I know how essential it is that this person trembles, that they sweat, that they see sin as being exceedingly sinful and that they deserve God's wrath. So when mercy comes, they'll embrace it like a dying man. And so it's very important to learn to do that. And you can see Jesus doing it with the rich young ruler. He didn't run after him and say, hey, how about selling half your goods? No, he loved his money. He cannot serve God and mammon. You know, that rich young ruler, when Jesus gave him the commandments, I don't know if you've noticed that there's something Jesus tossed in there that most people don't notice. He gave five commandments and he just says, you shall not extort. What's that about? You shall not extort. So my my... My suspicion is that rich young ruler was rich through extortion. Why would Jesus say that? Mm. You know, he, he was self-righteous. He was deceitful. He said, I've kept all those from my youth. No one's kept the law from their youth. <laughs> but God requires truth in the inward parts. And he loved his money. And you cannot mm. serve God and mammon. <clears throat> and he mm. got his mammon through uh, illegal means anyway. So mm. <clears throat> and we have to do the same with sinners. We have to... Um, Sometimes say to them, and I love doing this, when some guy says, no, I've never really looked with lust. When I look at a, a young lady, I, I look at her because of her beauty. I don't lust. I give them a, a curveball. I just say, when did you last look at pornography? I didn't say, do you look at pornography? I say, when did you last look at pornography? And they don't know how to answer that last night. I say, that's lust. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's good to get people to admit their sins and bring shame to them because it's going to be a shameful thing on the day of judgment when all those secret sins come out as evidence of their guilt. 
and all their yeah. sin and shame yes. shall be punished. And that's a fearful thing. My heart mm. trembles at the thought of it. Mm. Amen, brother. Well, thank you so much uh, for that, Ray. As always, brother, it's great to be with you. And one last thing, if people want to get involved in what you're doing in London, how do they reach out to you? How do they get involved with that? Yeah, just go to the uh, London livingwaters.com forward slash London. All the great. details are there. All you got to do is register, say, oh, girl, and we'll give you 500 free gospel tracks and a little bag to put them in. And uh, perhaps you'll be involved in maybe, <clears throat> I saw a comment today where someone says, I live in England. I hope this is going to start a revival because we mm. certainly need it. Who knows? Amen. Oh, that's awesome. No, that's great. Well, just to our just to our our our, our viewers here, I just want to remind you to go also to the Red Grace Media podcast, the Christ and Kingdom podcast, because I've got an episode there on evangelism. I think it's like episode fifteen or something, maybe maybe earlier than that, thirteen. But it kind of complements what we were talking about here with Ray. So uh, be sure and check that out. Subscribe to that podcast, of course, and to this channel. But thanks so much. God bless you guys for watching. Ray, thank you so much for coming on, brother. As always, it's good to see you, good to be with you. And um, we, we'll have to talk. I, I, I'll ask you something when we get off air here in a second, but it's great to see you. God bless you.